you know. So thermochemistry, we've covered the calorimetry topics already. And so in an early chapter in most chemistry textbooks, chapters four, five, or six, somewhere in that range, um, they do calorimetry, and then they move on to something called Hess's law and enthalpy changes. We've seen enthalpy change already in our kinetics unit. We called it the heat of reaction, delta H. So now we're going to look at it a bit more in depth, and we're going to see how, how our calorimetry connects to it as well. We've, we've seen a little, bit, a little bit of that last week. Um, then there's a big jump from chapter four, five, six, all the way to chapter 16, 17, 18, that range in most books where they continue with thermodynamics and thermodynamics takes the enthalpy changes that we're learning about today and extends them to things called entropy changes and Gibbs free energy changes. And it connects all of that with equilibrium and, and electrochemistry. Well, thermodynamics is kind of like the the, you know, the one ring to rule them all in, in chemistry. It ties everything together that's equilibrium related, okay? So let's, let's jump in. So question one, very straightforward. Um, we, we use the term standard states when we refer to different substances in thermodynamics. Um, you can think of something like water, as simple as water. You can have water vapor, you can have water gas, water liquid, water solid. Well, the standard state of water would be the most stable form of water at 25 degrees Celsius and one atmosphere pressure. So in other words, essentially normal conditions. If you think about that, one atmosphere pressure is the pressure we're living under most days and 25 degrees is kind of like room temperature, a little bit warmer. So the standard state of water under those conditions would be just liquid water. Okay. The standard state of copper would be solid copper, right? Copper at room temperature is solid metal. The standard state of sodium chloride table salt would be the solid crystal lattice structure of table salt. Hydrogen, the center state would be the diatomic H2 gas, right? It's not just H, it's Hofbrinkel elements would be H2 gas. And then aqueous sodium chloride, the standard state there would be a one molar solution of sodium chloride dissolved in water, okay? Question two, we're gonna be looking at what's called formation reactions. And a formation reaction is a chemical reaction where you form a compound from its elements in their standard states, okay? So you write a simple balanced equation forming propane gas, C3H8, from the elements that make up the compound. Right, so let's try this. It's not that hard. Propane is made of carbon and hydrogen, as you can see. So you would write carbon, and at standard conditions, it would be a solid. St carbon has more than one allotrope, right? It can be graphite, it can be diamond, it can be buckyballs and things like that. But uh, the graphite is the standard form, standard state of carbon. And then that reacts with hydrogen gas. So H2 is the standard state, H2 gas for hydrogen. And it forms the propane, C3H8 gas. Okay. Balance it, put a three for carbon, a four for hydrogen. And now we've written a formation reaction for propane gas. And notice in this formation reaction, we formed one mole of propane, right? If you have the data booklet with you, or for those of you at Sisler, if you have your Appendix C in front of you there from your textbook, the back of your textbook, uh, you'll see a table in the textbook similar to what we have here. Um, these are organized by elements, and then there's three columns of numbers. For today, we're only going to be looking at this column, delta H not F, delta H with a degree symbol, 
and then a subscript F. That's referred to as the standard. That's what the degree symbol means. Does that sound familiar? Do you remember electrochemistry, standard cell potentials had degree symbols beside them? So the standard enthalpy, the delta H, of formation. That's what the F stands for. Feel free to write in the booklet directly if you want to label that. So that's the standard enthalpy of formation in kilojoules per mole for various substances. Now we just finished saying that a formation reaction involves forming a compound from its elements in their standard states. So when you look at this table, find propane. Well, propane's probably gonna be under the carbon section. So here's the carbon section and you wanna find C3H8 gas and there it is. And negative 104, if you're using a different textbook, a different source, your number might be slightly different, but uh, I'll write that down here. So for this reaction, the enthalpy of formation is, what did I just say? Negative 104 kilojoules per mole of reaction. Now, since this reaction has one mole of propane, you could sort of think of it as per mole of propane also. Okay. Negative means this is an exothermic process, right? Now, when you look back at that table, you'll notice there's a bunch of things that are zero. Can you look at all the ones that appear as zeros? And do you see a pattern? What substances end up having enthalpies of formation equal to zero? The elements in their standard states, right? So for example, if you look at chlorine, Cl2 gas, that would be the standard state of chlorine at, at 25 degrees in one atmosphere. Its standard enthalpy of formation is zero because we defined this delta H not F as the enthalpy change for the formation reaction. And a formation reaction means forming it from the elements in their standard state. But this is an element in its standard state. So then you don't really need to form it, do you? It's, it's already an element in its standard state. So therefore its enthalpy change is zero, right? So if you glance through there, you'll notice wherever you have an element in its standard state, its enthalpy change is zero. It's, it's delta, delta H not F is zero. Chlorine can be aqueous. You can dissolve chlorine in water, but that's not its standard state. So that has an enthalpy change associated with it, right? You can have chlorine um, atoms. They're not shown here, but you can just have chlorine atoms, Cl, right? That's not the standard state of chlorine. Cl2 is the standard state of chlorine. So Cl atoms would likely, would, would have a value for delta H not F. The reason I point that out is because you might uh, be given a question where you need enthalpies of formation, and they may not give you the enthalpy of formations of the elements. They may just say, just leave them out. You're supposed to know that the enthalpy change of those elements in their standard states is zero. So you don't have to be given that information. You're supposed to just know that, okay? Try part B and part C, write a, and write a formation reaction for carbon dioxide gas, and then look up in your table, it's enthalpy change. The heat of formation is what I'll usually call that, the standard heat of formation. So this time we have carbon solid reacting with oxygen gas, and that's gonna make CO2 gas pretty straightforward. The enthalpy of formation, the heat of formation, the standard heat of formation. Look up carbon dioxide. It's also in the carbon section. Make sure you're looking at carbon dioxide and not carbon monoxide. CO2 is negative 393 
0.5 kilojoules per mole of reaction. Okay, and one more here, water vapor. So we have hydrogen gas. Reacts with half a mole of oxygen gas. Producing water vapor. Half a mole of O2. And you look up water in your table, it's going to be in the hydrogen section. The enthalpy change for this reaction, the heat of formation for water vapor. Notice it's not the same as the heat of formation of liquid water, right? It's a different number. So it's negative 242 kilojoules per mole of reaction. If you joined us late, we're getting these numbers from the data booklet, thermodynamic data. Or if you're a CISLR student, you came in late, this is at the back of your textbook in Appendix C. Okay, so just quickly give an answer for number three. We just discussed that. So why is the standard enthalpy change for oxygen gas, the enthalpy of formation of oxygen gas equal to zero kilojoules per mole. I don't need to look that up. I can tell you that it's zero. All right, so the simple explanation there is that it's because O2 gas is the standard state of that element. So you don't need to form the element, right? It's already in its standard state. It's not a compound, therefore zero kilojoules per mole. All right, so one of the things we're gonna do immediately is start using these rules you see. We're going to talk about enthalpy changes for chemical reactions, not just heats of formation, but chemical reaction delta H's like we had in our kinetics unit. If you multiply an equation by some number, suppose you double the, all the coefficients, if you double the coefficients, then the amount of heat produced or the heat absorbed in that reaction would double. So when you multiply an equation by some number, delta H gets multiplied by the same number. If there's 300 kilojoules of energy being produced for every one mole of that product, then there'll be 600 kilojoules of energy produced if you had two moles of that, of that product, right? So when you multiply an equation by a number, you multiply delta H by that same number. When the forward reaction is exothermic, the reverse reaction is endothermic, isn't it? Right, if the forward reaction is endothermic, then the reverse reaction is exothermic. That means if you reverse an equation, you have to change the sign of the delta H. Right? When delta H is negative, that's an exothermic process. When delta H is positive, that's an endothermic process. So reversing the equation, you change the sign of delta H. And the third one, this one actually gets a name for it. This third rule has a name. It's Hess's Law. If you're from a Grant Park student, we saw this back in our kinetics unit. Do you remember those, those multiple step potential energy diagrams that we used to draw? 
potential energy, uh, remember this? If you had a delta H for step one and you had another delta H for step two, do you remember saying that the overall delta H is just the sum of those delta H's, right? The overall delta H was the sum of delta H1 plus delta H2. Well, then look at this rule. If you're adding equations together, which is what we do when we have a reaction mechanism, right? We get the overall reaction. We add equations together. The delta H in the overall reaction is just the sum of the delta H's from the equations that were being added. That's Hess's law, okay? We used it back in our kinetics unit. So take a look at question four. We had three, we had propane gas over here, right? Propane gas, a, an enthalpy of formation reaction. We also had a carbon dioxide re formation reaction. And we had a water formation reaction. So what we wanna do is rearrange those formation reactions. So we can reverse them. We can multiply them by some number if we want. We want to reverse, we want to manipulate the equations so that when we add them together, we get the combustion reaction for propane gas. Okay, so look at the combustion reaction. It has one mole of propane. It's a reactant, that one mole of propane, right? Well, the formation reaction for propane has one mole of propane in it. The problem though, is that it's a product, right? We want the propane as a reactant. So we're gonna take the formation reaction that we wrote for propane and simply reverse it, right? So let's do that here. C3H8 gas, if we reverse it, you get three carbons and you get four hydrogens. But looking up above, we just finished saying that if you reverse an equation, you're gonna to need to change the sign of its delta H. So we said earlier that the heat of formation of propane was negative 104 kilojoules per mole. So now over here, the delta H not of this reaction would be positive 104 kilojoules per mole, right? We reversed the equation, so we simply changed the sign of its delta H. Now, looking back at the overall reaction, we now have our propane in place. We want three moles of carbon dioxide as product. Three moles of carbon dioxide as product. Well, looking at the carbon dioxide formation reaction, there's one mole of carbon dioxide as product. So if I just multiply that equation by three, I'll get the three moles that I wanted, right? So let's go back and do that here. So you'll have three moles of carbon solid plus three moles of oxygen gas, and that's going to produce three moles of carbon dioxide gas. We multiplied the equation by three. So we take the delta H of formation and multiply it by three. But I'm gonna write it showing that work. I'm just gonna write three times negative 393.5 kilojoules per mole. And I'll leave it like that. Okay, so three, whoops, sorry. Three times negative 393.5. And finally, do the same thing for water vapor. We want four moles of water vapor in the overall reaction. So water, there was one mole of water in the formation reaction. So we'll take that formation reaction and multiply everything by four, right? So coming back here, multiply everything by four will give us four moles of hydrogen gas plus two moles of oxygen gas will produce four moles of water vapor. 
since we multiplied everything by four, we'll take four times the heat of formation, negative 242 kilojoules per mole. Okay. And finally, to get the overall reaction, what do we get if we add up these reactions? Well, let's, let's add them up. The three moles of carbon cancels out. The four moles of hydrogen cancels out. So the stuff that didn't cancel out was one mole of propane, five moles of oxygen, three moles of CO2, and four moles of water. And that's our overall reaction, right? So it adds up properly, okay? Then Hess's law says the enthalpy change in the overall reaction is just the sum of these enthalpy changes here, right? So grab your calculator and add those up. So we have 104 plus three times negative 393.5 plus four times negative 242 equals negative I think I'll just round it off to a whole number, negative 2,045 kilojoules per mole of reaction. Any questions about that? Okay. No questions about that? then note, let's notice something. I deliberately forced you there to write out all the stupid formation reactions and multiply them and reverse them. There's a faster way we could have arrived at the answer, okay? Write it underneath. If I want the delta H combustion for this reaction, the standard enthalpy of combustion, Look what I could have done much faster than all the movies did there. There were three moles of carbon dioxide product, right? So I could have just said three times the heat of formation of carbon dioxide gas. Plus, there were four moles of water vapor, right? As products. So plus four times the heat of formation of water vapor. And let's put that in brackets. Aren't those the products, right? So basically, what did I just do? I, I took the products in the reaction that we wanted, the combustion reaction, and I added up their heats of formation but I multiplied each heat of formation by the number of moles in the balanced equation, right? And I did that for the products. Well, we then just subtract and we do the same thing for the reactants. But now notice the reactants, it's not just the enthalpy of, of propane, but let's write that, the enthalpy of formation for propane gas, C3H8 gas, its coefficient was a one, so we just, we don't multiply it by any number. Do I have to put plus five times the enthalpy of formation of oxygen? Do I have to put that in there as well? Plus five times the enthalpy of formation of oxygen? Somebody, do I need to put that in? No. Why not? Is it zero? Yeah, the enthalpy of formation of oxygen is zero. So when you have elements like that, you just ignore them. Okay. So then we just write that. Now, if you compare what we just wrote at the bottom to what we did in the table up here, do you see it's the same thing? We took three times the heat of formation of CO2. Well, that's what we had right there in the, in the table up above plus four times, well, that's what we have right here. Then we said minus the heat of formation of this. Well, minusing changes the sign, doesn't it? So when we say minus the heat of formation of propane, 
It's like when we just changed the sign of the enthalpy of formation up here and then added it together, right? So what we just sort of illustrated there was that you can calculate the heat of reaction. This happened to be a combustion reaction, but it could be any reaction by taking heats of formation of products minus heats of formation of reactants, right? The sum of the heats of formations of products minus the sum of the heats of formation of reactants gives you the delta H of the reaction, right? Now, when I say the heats of formation of products, each one multiplied by its coefficient, right? Minus the sum of the heats of formation of reactants, each one multiplied by its coefficient, okay? Anybody unclear on what I mean by that? That little statement? is going to be really important because what we're doing here with heats of formation, if you look back at your data booklet or your textbook, if you have the textbook there, there are other columns of data, right? There's not just heats of formation, there's Gibbs free energies of formation. There's entropies of formation as well. What we're doing here with enthalpies of formation as we'll see later, you can do exactly the same thing with these other numbers to calculate the Gibbs free energy change for a reaction or the entropy change for a reaction, okay? So that same little basic idea, add up all the products and minus all the reactants, it works later on as well. Take a look at question five. Okay, so question five gives us some formation reactions for P4O6 and for P4O10. These are the formation reactions, right? Which means these delta H's are actually delta H naught F's, aren't they? They're standard heats of formation. They're not just delta H's understand that a heat of formation is just a delta H, but it's a delta H for a formation reaction with everything in the standard state. So given that information, we want to calculate the enthalpy change for this reaction. Can you do that? Can you take these formation reactions, rearrange them just like we did in the last question so that they add up to give this overall reaction. So what I usually do is I put my little line down like that and I rewrite the reaction that I want, P4O6 solid plus two O2 gases creates P4O10 solid. That's what I'm aiming for. This is kind of like writing a reaction mechanism, right? That's, that's the overall reaction. And then what I do next is I look in this overall reaction for things that are weird. I look for something weird. Don't look for oxygen. Oxygen's not weird. Look, hey, look at this, P4O10. That's kind of weird. So when I look back up here, there's probably only going to be one P4O10. There it is, right? I want the P4O10 as a product and I want one mole of it. Well, it's right there as a product and it's got one mole. So I don't need to do anything. I just write the equation down. P4 plus, I get a bit lazy with my phases. I start leaving them out as you can see, produces P4O10. And because I didn't do anything to that equation, I just recopied it, it's delta H is going to equal whatever it said up above, negative 2940.1 kilojoules per mole. Now, the other thing that's weird in my overall reaction is P4O6. That's weird. I look back up here at these other equations we were given and 
hey, there's only one P406, there it is. But it's a product I want it as a reactant. So I need to take this equation and reverse it, don't I? So let's reverse it. P406 produces P4 plus 302s. If I reversed the equation, then I have to change the sign of its delta H, right? So the delta H here was negative 1640.1. So then the delta H down here would be positive 1640.1 kilojoules per mole. Right, let's be sure we haven't made a mistake. If I add these up, the P4s cancel. 302s on the right and 502s on the left, these three will be canceled. And instead of five, I'll have 202s left and I want 202s. So, so this adds up properly. It does add up to give the overall reaction, right? Then now we're gonna use Hess's law the heat of the delta change, sorry, the delta H, the enthalpy change, the heat of reaction is just the sum of these delta H's, right? Hess's law. The overall reaction's enthalpy change is the sum of the enthalpy changes for the reactions that were added together. So 1640.1 plus negative 2940.1 gives me negative 1300 kilojoules per mole of reaction. Pretty straightforward. Try the next one yourself. There's three reactions we're given. Notice they're not all formation reactions. The last one's not a formation reaction. The second one's not a formation reaction, right? That's okay. They don't have to be formation reactions. But we have these three reactions whose delta H's are given. We want to use that information in Hess's law, just like we did a moment ago, to find this reaction's enthalpy change. So let's do exactly what we did up, up, up above. The overall reaction I want. Now, sometimes I, I told you I get lazy with the phases, right? Sometimes you do have to watch that. For example, there might be a reaction with H2O gas and another reaction with H2O liquid. If that were the case, you would show the phases because you, you'd get mixed up otherwise, okay? In this case, I think I can leave out the phases, but if you feel like you want to put them in, go for it. So there's my overall reaction. I said before, look for something unusual, something weird. Well, all three of these guys are kind of, what I mean by unusual or weird is simply, it's unlikely to show up in more than one place. That's what I mean, right? So something that's unlikely to show up in more than one of these reactions. So for example, N2O, it only shows up where N2O? It shows up in the third reaction, doesn't it? Nowhere else. Well, then that's a good place to start. I want one N2O. Well, that equation has two N2Os. So I'm going to have to multiply that equation by a half, aren't I? Right? So if you multiply it by a half, we'll have N2O produces 1N2 and then half of an O2. Since I multiplied it by a half, the delta H for that would be half of what it was up above. When you multiply by, an, by a number, the delta H is multiplied by that same number. So now I have my N2O in place. I also want three NOs in place. Well, the NOs, hmm, they appear in more than one reaction. 
Ooh. What about the NO2? I want one NO2 as a reactant. Well, NO2 only appears once. It appears in the second equation. So I think I'll use that. I want one NO2 and I want it as a reactant. That equation up above has two NO2s and their products. So I'm gonna to have to reverse the equation to make it a reactant and I'll have to multiply by a half as well, right? So let's do that, reverse it and multiply by a half. So we get one NO2 produces one NO and if I multiply by a half, I'll get a half of an O2. I reversed the equation, so I have to change the sign of its delta H. I multiplied it by a half, so I also have to multiply it by a half. So you can show that in more than one way. I'll put it as negative a half times whatever it was up above, negative 113.1. Negative a half because I reversed it. So now how are we doing? Well, we have the 1N2O, good. We have 1NO2, good. We have one NO, but I want three NOs. So I need two more NOs, right? Now, another thing you can sometimes start doing is saying, are there things in these two reactions we've written that we don't want? Are there things we want to cancel out? Well, I don't want this N2, right? It's got to cancel out. It's not supposed to be there in the end. You could also say, I don't want these half and half. I don't want this whole one oxygen, right? Half an O2 plus half an O2. That's one O2. I don't want that. So I have to get rid of an N2. I have to get rid of an O2. And I need two more NOs. So then you look, the only thing we have left is that first reaction, which we haven't used. It's got one N2, one O2, and makes two N. Hey, that sounds just like what I'm looking for, isn't it? So if I just write that exactly as it shows up there, N2 plus O2 makes two NOs, I think that's going to work perfectly. I didn't have to do anything to that equation, so it's delta H is exactly what it said, positive 180.7. double check that you haven't screwed it up. N2 cancels with N2. This O2 cancels with these two half O2s. And when I look at what's not canceled, NO2 and N2O combine to give me three NOs. I've got it right. Okay. Then now we use Hess's law. The overall delta H will just be the sum of those delta H's that we've written. So 180.7 plus negative a half times negative 113.1 plus half of negative 163.2. I got 155.7. And Eola, is that what you got? 155.7? positive, right? Kilojoules per mole of reaction, which means the overall reaction was endothermic, right? Positive delta H. Folks, any questions about that? Anybody with a question about that or does that seem okay? Dahlia, are you okay with that? Yeah, I'm good. All right, then let me see if we can just mix things up slightly. Look at question eight. Okay, question eight is the same idea that we've just done, but with a slightly different twist, okay? So we have these three equations up above. And we want to use those three equations to derive 
the standard enthalpy of formation for copper oxide, solid copper oxide. Check the answer in your data booklet. Right, see if you can do that. So don't look in your data booklet until you're finished the question, right? Don't look in your appendix to your textbook. So just use these three equations and their delta H's do what we did a minute ago to find the standard enthalpy of formation of CuO. Hey, Owen, did you congratulate your sister? Yes. And did you congratulate your friend? Also, yes. Are you sure about that, Owen? Does that yeah. mean, that mean you're actually, Owen has no friends? You're lost. admitting that he's your okay. friend? Okay. I don't really congratulate. Yeah, so. Folks, your classmate. He's just, he just sad it wasn't him. He's sad it's what it wasn't him. Your your classmates, Carlin and, and uh, Graydon, have qualified for the Canada Wide Science Fair. So congratulations to them both. Thanks, Mr. Fanny. You're quite welcome. So folks, how is this question different from what we did in the last two examples? What's the only difference? Somebody, what's the only? We don't thing? have the whole. Uh, we don't have the whole equation. We just have the product that we need. Well, not quite, but you're almost right. We don't have the equation, right? It didn't give us the equation. That's what's different, right? Before we knew what equation we were trying to find the delta H for, this this one doesn't doesn't seem to give us the equation, but Homera, it actually does, doesn't it? because it said we want to derive the standard enthalpy of formation. Well, didn't we just say a minute ago what a formation reaction was? Almera? Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the formation reaction would be what? Cu plus O makes CuO solid. Almost. Cu plus what? Um, plus O2. Ah, yes, plus O2, right? I'm having trouble with my, <laughs> what the hell is that? I'm having trouble with my iPad here. There we go. So Cu plus O2 makes CuO, right? And I guess Cu plus half of an O2, right? So Cu plus half of an O2 will make CuO. There's the reaction we're trying to get. That's the formation reaction for solid copper oxide, isn't it? Yeah. Does it matter um, whether we say like half an O2 or we say one O2 and two copper two copper? Um, does it matter whether we say half of an O2 or if you double everything and end up saying two CUOs, that's what you're asking? Yeah. It does matter because the enthalpy of formation is per mole. So you wanna make one mole of the product, right? And of course, if you doubled everything from what we just talked about, that would double the delta H, wouldn't it? Yeah, so you wanna always, if you're doing a formation reaction, you should be forming one mole of the product. Okay, so once you've realized that that's the equation you're looking for, then this equation, this question should turn into exactly the same as the other ones, right? I'm looking up above, what, what are these SO2s and what the hell is that? That looks weird. Well, let's, let's, let's see. The first equation has copper in it. I'll have to multiply by a half copper plus half of a sulfur gives me half of a Cu2S. 
<laughs> the delta H for that would be half negative 79.5. You don't have to start exactly the same place I did, right? There's more than one way to do these. I want one CUO, while the third equation has two CUOs. So I'll take the third equation and just times it by a half. And then maybe I'm going to, my third equation, I'm going to think about things I want to cancel out. Right? I've got my copper in place. I've got my copper oxide in place. The half Cu2S, that does cancel already. But I don't want this half of a sulfur, and I don't want this half of an SO2. So that second equation if I reverse it and times it by a half, that'll give me half of an SO2 on the left, half of a sulfur on the right, half of an oxygen on the right. I reversed it and multiplied by a half, so negative a half times negative 297. Let's see if that works out properly. Sulfurs cancel, the sulfur dioxides cancel, and then I've got one copper, I've got one CuO, I have one O2 on the left, and I've got half of an O2 on the right, so when that cancels, it's going to work out the way I want. I'll have half of an O2 on the left, so that works out properly. Then the overall delta H using Hess's law would be negative one half times negative 297 plus positive a half times negative 527.5 plus positive a half times negative 79.5. I get negative 155 kilojoules per mole. We look up copper oxide in our data table, in our data booklet. There's copper oxide. Its heat of formation, according to this, is negative 156 kilojoules per mole. I think we've done a pretty good job. So you notice heats of formation can be calculated from known enthalpy changes of other reactions, right? Just like we did there. Anybody at home or here have a question about that? Yes, Aniola. Would you ever have to multiply higher than two or so? possibly? Yeah. Yeah. Nothing crazy like multiplying equations by doubling them or maybe tripling them, but you wouldn't be multiplying by 12 or something like that. That wouldn't happen. All right, take a look at question nine. Have your data booklet or your appendix beside you. Sisler folks, can you guys speak to me here, please? I keep saying refer to your textbook. Do, does anybody from Sisler not have this data with them? Appendix C in your textbook? Oh, we have it. And do you have the textbooks there with you too? Uh, yes. Okay, awesome. Okay. So your numbers in your textbook could be slightly different from my numbers, but they should be very similar. So question nine, we're going to use Hess's law and the heats of formation 
to find delta H, not the standard enthalpy change for these reactions. Okay, so let's do the first one together. Is that a balanced equation? No, it's not, right? So balance your equation first. We'll need two carbon dioxides, three waters. Would, I think that's an oversight on my part that it wasn't already balanced because the way you balance it will, have, will impact the delta H, right? You shouldn't have to be balancing these. And then we have four plus three, I've got seven. So I need seven halves, O2. All right, so that's how I'm gonna balance the equation. So if this is how I'm balancing it, now if you're going to balance it with whole numbers, if you're going to put a 2, a 7, a 4, and a 6, we're not going to get the same enthalpy changes, right? Yours will be double mine. So if you want to get the same one that I'm getting, you should put 3 and a half O2s, twos, seven halves O2s. Twos. Okay, so using what we talked about on the first page, the Heat of heat, the standard enthalpy change of this reaction will be, I'm not gonna write this every single time, but let's write it at least once here. It's gonna equal, we look at the products, it's gonna equal two times the heat of formation of carbon dioxide gas plus three times the heat of formation of water vapor those are all the products, minus the heat of formation of the, what is that, C2H6, ethane gas, C2H6 gas. The oxygen is an element in the standard state, so we can ignore that. You might want to note it for yourself why we're ignoring it. Oxygen's an element in its standard state, so its heat of formation is going to be zero, right? So if you look at what I'm doing there, what we talked about on the first page of the handout, we're adding up the heats of formations of products minus heats of formations of reactants, and each one is multiplied by its coefficient in the balanced equation. So now grab your data booklet or look in the appendix of your textbook, carbon dioxide gas, be sure you're looking at exactly the right formula. So we want two times negative 393.5 plus three times, okay, water is probably gonna be water liquid. We want water gas. So be sure you're looking at the right one. Water vapor would be negative 242. Those are my products minus the one reactant, ethane gas, C2H6. That's in the carbon section of the tables. C2H6, negative 84.7. So negative 1428.3 kilojoules per mole of reaction is what I get, which tells me this reaction, not surprisingly, because it's a combustion reaction, it's producing lots and lots of heat, right? When you burn hydrocarbons, it produces lots of heat. That's, that's why we burn natural gas in a Bunsen burner, right? To produce heat. So it's highly exothermic. All 
All right, let's do one more of those together. I'll go down and do, let's do part D. Part D. Understand that the subscript you put beside delta H is just a label, right? Sometimes you don't put anything, you just say delta H naught. Sometimes you can put reaction. It's the heat enthalpy change of the reaction. If the reaction is a, is a known type of reaction, then you could say something like combustion. You could say something like neutralization. That doesn't mean anything special. It's just labeling the kind of reaction this is, right? So the enthalpy change for this reaction would be four times the water vapor. We saw that up above, water vapor was negative 242 minus the N2O4. Look up nitrogen in the table, N2O4. Depending on the table, you may not have every one of these. So if you're doing one of these questions and your textbook appendix doesn't have one of them, then that question, you can just omit it, okay? So N2O4 gas would be 10. Notice I'm ignoring hydrogen and I'm ignoring nitrogen. Those are both elements in their standard states. All right, that's not rocket science, right? Can you take a look at question 11? This one is rocket science, yes. Number 11. Okay, so here's a very common thing they like to do on the AP exam. They take, we, we all understand how to do this basic calculation, right? And now we're, they're gonna give us this question 11 where they say, here's a complicated looking reaction. Now, let me just point out on the AP chemistry exam, you won't have this full table of data, right? But they would, if they're giving you a question like this, they would give you a partial table with just the things in it that you need, right? But then in that table, you would see this methyl hydrazine and it'll have a question mark for its delta H not F. And you go, oh, I'm gonna to have to calculate the delta H not F of the methyl hydrazine, right? All right, so the reaction is highly exothermic, which is why it's being used in a rocket. So negative 4594 is the kilo per kilojoules per mole reaction. So do you understand exactly what you're gonna do here? We're not calculating delta H, we know delta H. And we know all of the heats of formation except for one. So can you just go find the one missing enthalpy of formation? Okay. So there's the chemical reaction. I'll leave it there if you're watching this video. So we're looking for the heat of formation of that weird looking methyl hydrazine in 2H3CH3. We know the enthalpy change for the reaction. So negative 4594 will equal 12 times negative 242, the enthalpy of formation of the water vapor, plus four times the carbon dioxide. Did we see that one already? Negative 393.5. 
Okay, the nitrogen in the equation is a product, that's an element in the standard state, so zero is its enthalpy of formation. And then we have to subtract the enthalpy of formation of the methyl hydrazine, that's the thing I'm looking for, plus five times the dinitrogen tetroxide, but we just saw that one earlier also, didn't we? That one was 10, so five times 10. We used to have a, do you guys ever have Macintosh as your math teacher? Yeah. yeah. Back in the day? He used to complain after I taught chemistry students how to use the solver on their calculators that they would now use it to solve everything, right? You could use your solver to solve that equation, couldn't you? If you want, but it's really just a bit of algebra. So make Mr. Macintosh proud and don't use your solver. Oh, you're right. Thank you for pointing that out. Okay. I forgot to multiply the enthalpy of formation by four because its coefficient was four in the balanced equation. Thanks, Weldon. So 12 plus four times negative 393.5. And I said, I just said, don't use your solver. And now I'm regretting at five o'clock at night after a whole day. Am I going to get this wrong? Minus. I got a very small answer. Yep, 16 and a half. Hey, I did it right. In chemistry, we just take votes to see if the answer is right. So we just had three people here agree that that's the right answer. So therefore it must be the right answer. Democracy in chemistry. 16.5 kilojoules per mole. The enthalpy, that's a pretty small enthalpy formation for such a weird looking compound. But. Okay. At home, are we good with that? Yeah. Hey, Homera, what time did you get up this morning? Um, around six, I think, yeah. Six? Yeah. Six? Aren't you supposed to get up like before sunrise and have like a special meal or something? Yeah, that's not related to me really. <laughs> the other time we were also studying. I mean, close. You said Ramadan, but it's had, close, you know. I had some, uh, a student this morning say they got up at 3 a.m. this morning for the for their meal yeah. prayers and things like that. My mom does back home, but us studying is our religious, you know. <laughs> See, well, yes, okay. <laughs> I'll stop there. All right, so folks, you can you notice we're basically done, right? There's a little bit of practice there. So that wraps up thermochemistry, okay? So calorimetry, Hess's law, enthalpies of formation, how to use them, okay? Would you try some of these other questions that we skipped here, okay? You don't necessarily have to do every single one, but you should do some, okay? Just to make sure you understand it. Um, sometimes people especially in this last few weeks, they go, oh, I know, I know how to do that. I, I don't need to practice that because you get it right now in the moment. And then because you don't practice it, you actually don't get it stuck in your brain. And then you get to the exam and you throw away easy marks. Okay. So practice some of this. For those of you doing um, in, from my class, I'll probably post a web assign practice for this and it's optional. You can do what you like in it. Um, for the Sisler folks, I'll look in your textbook and I'll recommend some questions for you to do 
in your textbook. Okay, I'll recommend questions that have answers at the back of the book so you can check them, see how you're doing, okay? So next week, we're going to move on to the later topics. We're going to talk about entropy, entropy changes, and then Gibbs free energy change. Okay, so next week, we get a lot more in depth in thermodynamics, which is the later part of this, of this unit. Okay, don't forget those YouTube videos that are now streaming live every day on the College Board website. You don't have to watch every single one. Take a look at the topics and uh, decide which topics you would benefit most from to go watch. Okay. All right, folks at home, any questions? All right. Have a great week, folks. We'll talk Excuse to me, Mr. Partner. Yes, Ivan. It's Ivan.